uh, venture. Um, after Jennifer and Sarah's presentation, uh, we'll take some questions uh, for about 10 minutes just on their presentation, and then we'll, we'll open up, uh, we'll bring in the whole panel, which is the four speakers, um, together with Noel Yunkin uh, and Caroline Jordan, who are, whose details are there on the, on the, um, on the, on the table. So uh, we hope it goes very, very well. Uh, we hope that you'll get a chance to get your questions answered. Um, we'll, if, we'll try and get as many questions in as possible. Uh, and uh, the, it is planned that the Q&A will, will give us a half an hour for Q&A at the end. So there should be ample time. And um, we could even have some live questions. So you get your questions in. Uh, in advance and we'll make note and obviously we'll, we'll endeavour to answer as many as possible and then spread that. So if you just unmute there. Mm, you can mute me. Um, uh, we will also be recording this event today. Uh, and so that's just to be aware of that yourself. And obviously, when uh, we'll, we'll now, I think, ready to move on to the first principal speaker, who is Dr. Mary O'Mahony. Uh, Mary is a specialist in public health medicine in uh, Cork, uh, HSC South, uh, and is a lead, clinical lead in public health for fetal outcome spectrum disorder and its allied um, problems. Thank you. Mary, if you could just unmute, please. Hello, yes, I'm unmuted. Loud and clear, Mary. Okay, I'll just share a screen. Have I my screen up there correctly or not? Not yet, Mary, so Not if you'd yet, like okay. to click share screen. Have I my screen up now? That's perfect, Mary. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Joe. And I'd like to start with an acknowledgement. Internationally and here in Ireland as well, its foster parents and adoptive parents have led the way in raising awareness of FASD and supporting research into fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. But we need to move now towards a more population-based approach. Birth mothers and their children are the greater constituent group and along with foster parents and adoptive parents, they need support and care. Conflicting messages are a problem, and we need a consistent message for all women that no amount of alcohol at any stage of pregnancy is safe for your baby. We need to mainstream fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. We need to get rid of the stigma and recognize it as a disability. This slide shows the global prevalence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder among children and youth in the general population in 2012, and shows that Ireland has a high rate of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. In fact, the evidence in Ireland, in a study of 187 countries, Ireland featured among the five countries with the highest prevalence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And the evidence indicates that in Ireland, four in five of first pregnancies are exposed to alcohol and nearly one in two are exposed at high risk levels. Two in five pregnancies are unplanned, increasing the chance they will be exposed to alcohol. Pregnant women do not consistently receive timely maternity care for alcohol problems. Health professionals do not consistently provide information on the risks of drinking during pregnancy and we have no routine screening for alcohol during pregnancy. Most clinicians lack the capability to diagnose fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, so it largely remains undiagnosed. 
and families of people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder struggle to access appropriate support and report a lack of understanding from services, professionals and even other family members. In New Zealand, where they've looked at it, they find that 50% of children in state care have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now, it took 20 years of sustained advocacy to get fetal alcohol spectrum disorder included in, a stand, in standard coding and classification of diseases. And it's now included in DSM-5 as neurodevelopmental disorder, prenatal alcohol exposure. It's an alcohol-induced brain damage, which is permanent although there may be some remediation possible due to brain elasticity. And as highlighted in the earlier slide, children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are very overrepresented in state care, as are adults with FASD in correctional facilities. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder contributes to the well-known transgenerational cycle of addiction, as those with FASD are at increased risk of addiction to alcohol themselves. In addition to the personal cost, there's a significant economic impact. So it also makes business sense to prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorders occurring. For the person with FASD, they may, it may be associated with physical, mental, educational, social, and behavioral difficulties. So the next two slides will look at, try to look at the nature and the extent of the problem in Ireland. And looking first at the public health risk assessment, what population are most at risk? And the evidence would indicate that it is women who earn more than 35,000 per annum are the group of the population who are most at risk of having a child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder because they have enough disposable income that alcohol is always available in the home. And the next group at risk will be students and those from lower socioeconomic group because they have a greater tendency to binge drink. The risk is very high. It only takes 67 women to drink during pregnancy for a child to be born with fetal alcohol syndrome, which is the more severe end of the spectrum. And only 13 women to drink during pregnancy for a child to be born with non-fetal alcohol, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. But there are effective interventions that can help to reduce this risk. Screening and brief intervention for alcohol in adults is of proven effectiveness in reducing alcohol intake. And parent-child assistance programs for those who are at higher risk with maybe problematic drinking have been shown in North America to have good outcomes. Looking at gross indicator data of neurodevelopmental disorder in Ireland, there are three sources that I found. So the HSE's annual report for 2018 provided the numbers of referrals of adults to adult mental health and of children to child and adolescent mental health services. And those, those could be used to drive rates. And basically what this showed is that the rate of referral of children to child and adolescent mental health services is almost double the rate of referral of adults to adult mental health. And that's a worrying trend. The National Disability Authority profiled just less than 1,500 school leavers in 2016 who are seeking rehabilitation training or a day service. And I was able to review the details on the 286 from Cork and Kerry CHO4. And I was surprised to find that it showed that one fifth had no intellectual disability. Now, a very small proportion of those would have had physical and sensory disability, but that would have been very much the minority. And more than half, 56%, had no borderline or mild intellectual disability. Now, traditionally, people with mild intellectual disability really only ran into difficulty during their educational years. And once their education was completed, they would go on to get a job and have a full um, participation in life, independent participation. The National Council for Special Education did a report on special need assistance in school in 2018. And it showed that 3.5% of all students require special need assistance. There are many factors which influence the FASD risk and the outcome of pregnancy varies. There is a genetic component to the risk. Also nutritional status, access to prenatal care and intervention, 
access to contraception, child welfare policies, all can impact on risk. Also, life is difficult. And for women who continue to drink during pregnancy, there can be a reason for that. For those who may be pregnant and have been drinking, you know, it's never too late to cut out alcohol during pregnancy. The brain continues to develop throughout the whole of pregnancy. So abstaining from alcohol for the remainder of pregnancy has benefit. We need community solidarity and a cross societal approach if you want to reduce the incidence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Internationally, there has been no reduction in prenatal alcohol use over the past 20 years. Indeed, the reverse is the case. Population alcohol per capita dictates the percentage of hazardous and dependent drinkers in the population. In Ireland, it's the societal norm to drink, including during pregnancy. It's not a woman's problem. 74% of alcohol is drank by men. It's an alcohol problem. It's a hidden harm of our alcohol cons con consumption at population level. This shows our current poster and leaflet with our very clear, unambiguous message that no amount of alcohol at any stage of pregnancy is safe for your baby. And this message needs to be given consistently from our trusted sources, from the GP, the consultant obstetrician, the midwife, from all government supported initiatives such as our drug and alcohol task forces. And I want you to note that the HSE has a very clear policy on public health information initiatives related to alcohol and does not support industry sponsored initiatives. And this needs to be supported across government. The Department of Education needs to stop school use of alcohol industry supplied materials. And we all need to support and designate the Department of Health through the HSE as the provider of the message and the message materials. So for prevention of FASD in Ireland, we need leadership and governance, we need health education, we need preventive services, and we need enabling policy and legislation. So we have the HSE Health and Wellbeing Alcohol National Priority Programme, and last week we held the first meeting of the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Expert Advisory Group. The askwhatalcohol.ie forward slash pregnancy HSE page is the main source of HSE information on alcohol. And we are also input into the school curriculum. We have the Know the, know the Score uh, modules for the senior cycle, social and personal health education, and we're also inputting into the junior cycle, SPHE. Screening and brief intervention for alcohol in pregnancy is needed, but before we can introduce it, we need to have adequate services for women, and we really need to have cross societal support. The Public Health Alcohol Act in 2018, it needs to be implemented urgently and in full, particularly the provisions that allow for the pregnancy warning on alcoholic drink and to introduce the minimum unit price. Parent-child assistance programmes, I suppose they're further down the line and they will need cross-department like TUSLA and uh, HSE support. Last October, there was an FASD conference facilitated by the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service took place in Dublin. And at the end, there was a discussion group and the priority need that was identified by those present at the end were the consistent message that no amount of alcohol at any stage of pregnancy is safe for your baby. We need services to diagnose FASD with brain assessments so we can determine the child's strengths as well as the child's deficits and support and training is needed for carers, including frontline workers for their healing role. So I'll just finish up with this last slide. And the, the picture on the left shows the prominent conspicuous warning, which has now been implemented in New Zealand and Australia. It's a global first. On the right, you see the industry preferred label and our own Alcohol Action Ireland working with their NGO colleagues in Australia and New Zealand helped to bring about this groundbreaking labelling initiative on alcohol in pregnancy warning. Thank you. We're going to hand over now to Geraldine Hanley. Geraldine, if you could start your video and unmute.
ってます。Shared the screen there, Robbie. Yeah, that's fine, Geraldine. And if you just press from beginning over in the left hand side. Hi, my name is Geraldine Hanley, and um, I'm going to present um, a practice initiative change or practice change initiative that happened at Letterkenny University Hospital um, in 2014. Um, and this is um, this was a, a prescription for a healthy pregnancy was the name of the initiative. Um, this was a multidisciplinary, multi-agency group that was set up to address maternal alcohol consumption in pregnancy. The partnerships were between maternity services, um, Letterkenny, um, and specifically the antenatal clinic, and the health promotion services, the alcohol forum, and Donegal Education and Training Board. Um, it was decided to pilot the project and prior to that we had a review of literature or evidence base, project descriptor, ethical approval was received and a resource pack um, known as the toolkit was developed. Um, a subgroup were, were uh, active in developing the toolkit. We also had a staff training and masterclass in alcohol and pregnancy for CPT. The practical side of it, audit C screening, was integrated into the Booking Antenatal Clinic in Letterkenny University Hospital. Um, as it was a pilot, it was piloted in one consultant clinic um, and an evaluation did take place, both, both quantitative and qualitative, and a report was produced um, at the end. The project descriptor, um, one from the Scottish document, uh, Integrated Care Pathways, uh, would describe the project as local multidisciplinary, multi-agency response to maternal alcohol consumption, thereby providing pregnant women with information on the risks associated with use. Also, early assessment of alcohol-related problems in pregnancy, appropriate advice on use in pregnancy and treatment and care options. Um, ascertaining the true prevalence and extent of alcohol consumption in pregnancy, as we know, is, is difficult to ascertain because of underreporting um, and a lack of understanding of what constitutes a standard drink and therefore what constitutes low to moderate use. And this was addressed in page 18 of the toolkit. Um, health promotion advice. In antenatal settings, there is a responsibility to provide ongoing advice and support to expectant mums, including information of the risks of alcohol consumption uh, during pregnancy that is up to date, consistent and evidence based. How we went about it, um, the, audit screen, the audit screening was implemented into the booking clinic um, to address maternal alcohol consumption in order to identify the alcohol use among pregnant women along the continent from alcohol use to dependency. Um, an adapted SARE model was used within the antenatal setting um, and then onward referral um, or appropriate referral. Provision of printed information and screening to first time mums happened at 12 weeks um, and extended up to 20 weeks to include those who would be booking late at antenatal clinic. Uh, follow up at the 28 week antenatal appointment um, was regarding impact of intervention. The cohort that we targeted was based on previous 12 month period figures for booking clinics. Um, so one booking clinic per week was chosen uh, with 10 potential um, booking participants. Uh, so the cohort targeted was approximately 240 people. The toolkit developed um, contained a prescription for healthy pregnancy, uh, midwife's handbook, 
in relation to the SARE model. Um, and this was used for the midwives who had the screening and brief intervention training. Um, there was also the alcohol audit C tool, um, the alcohol prescription for a healthy pregnancy. And we also liaised with our Scottish counterparts um, to adapt the alcohol and pregnancy leaflet uh, for use during the project. An evaluation report was completed. Um, quantitative measures identified the number of screenings completed and the outcome. The qualitative measures incorporated were the mother's experience, um, information and advice that they received at 12 weeks, follow up at 12 weeks on the benefits and impact of same. We also evaluated the consultant and the midwife's experience of the training, the delivery in practice, and of the toolkit. The midwife's experience, um, midwife's experience of the project um, overall was very positive. Uh, and they, they would have found that the multidisciplinary, multi-agency involvement was most helpful. Um, because of the multidisciplinary, multi-agency involvement, the process had very clear guidance from the beginning of the project. The training, um, overall the midwives found the information and training uh, as effective, an effective intervention for alcohol use within the antenatal setting. Training provided the midwives with practical tools to enhance the engagement with these pregnant women. Um, the overall experience was positive. Uh, they felt it helped, the practice helped raise awareness with pregnant women on the harmful effects of alcohol um, on the unborn child. The practice also resulted in earlier intervention and appropriate referral. The stages of critical development chart was highlighted as a very useful tool when discussing the impact of alcohol in pregnancy. Midwives requested that this tool be used as a poster within the maternity setting. Scoring of the audit C was thought to be slightly confusing for midwives and it was requested that it would be amended based on feedback before uh, rollout at the next hospital wide level. This was the critical periods in human development chart that we used. Um, challenges for midwives. The process did involve extra time between the midwife and the pregnant woman during the booking process. This created somewhat of a challenge for us during busy antenatal clinics where we had confined space and a lot of um, attendees. However, midwives did feel that the benefits of the project outweighed the extra time spent delivering in practice. Further training um, has been requested by the midwives in the areas of um, maternal alcohol consumption. And this since has um, taken place. Um, the toolkit provided a very reliable source of appropriate evidence-based materials for all health professionals involved. It incorporated the SER model of care. The toolkit included the midwife's handbook on how to implement the same in practice, which was an invaluable resource for midwives. The leaflet was practical and useful, and the midwives requested that this leaflet would be uh, produced as a standard resource. Um, key points on patient engagement. There was a high rate of return on the 12-week self-reporting questionnaire. The 28-week feedback questionnaire had a low response rate, but the response was overwhelmingly positive about the inclusion of information on maternal alcohol consumption within the maternity setting. Verbal feedback to the midwives was overwhelmingly positive. Consumer feedback on the leaflet was really positive. And for a lot of the pregnant women, they reported that they didn't realize the dangers to the baby from drinking um, until um, they had been involved in this process. The prescription tool was not considered to be either useful or very practical, either by the midwives or by um, the, the, the women. Our current status at the moment um, for our pregnant ladies in Letterkenny, overall, this 
initiative was deemed uh, a great success in imparting key messages to women on maternal alcohol consumption. Um, consumer, midwife and consultant feedback confirmed that this was a very worthwhile initiative. Phase two rollout was planned, but didn't progress. However, the maternity unit has since committed to the MEC process um, and all midwives have received the MEC training um, with the rollout to commence in October 20. Sorry. Uh, and just before I finish up, in, in relation to um, the project, uh, we saw it as an investment in our future. Um, in a quote from Nelson Mandela, our children are our greatest treasure, they are our future. Um, thank you. Um, there are some references available um, and I would now like to hand over to uh, Dr. Um, Sarah Brown and Dr. Jennifer Shields. Thank you. So I'm always very grateful to Jen for doing all our tweeting and all our IT and slides. So thanks, Jen, for being in control of the slides and um, moving them on for me. I'm very grateful to be able to come and speak to you as part of the Fetal Alcohol Advisory and Support Team, which um, is Scottish Government funded. And I'm going to tell you about our journey over the last, I think it must be about eight years now. So. The hope for this session, we've got about 25 minutes, I'm going to speak for maybe the first 10 and then Jen will have the rest of the time. And really we were the first group of people who have had some dedicated funding to develop some expertise in FASD. By the end of this, you'll hear a little bit about how that came about, a bit of what we've done with our time and the small amount of funding we've been given. And um, we also sat on the sign guideline 156, which was published at the beginning of last year. And you'll hear a bit more from Jen about working with the families directly and what we hope to be doing um, in the coming years. So this is a confusing picture where I look like I've got an incredibly long head and straight hair, but I promise you it's still me. This was uh, our other members of our team and we had a full-time research assistant and support from public health who have been really helpful and supportive in Ayrshire. There's a map up on the top corner which just shows you about the geography of Scotland. So um, we're based kind of between Ayr and Arvon and um, yeah, we, we've got support from, from Edinburgh and the, the, the team over there. So this all goes back to oh, 2012 when I had never met Jen and um, there was some training put on by a Canadian team which was that uh, Professor Anna Hanlon Dirk Dearman, her team who had come over from Winnipeg. Now, the Scottish Government paid for them to come over and do, I think it was two sets of two or three day training. They did one up in Highland and one in the Central Belt, which is what we call kind of Glasgow, Edinburgh. Um, that was a result of one of the specialist advisors for the government scoping out practice around the world and that was a Churchill Fellowship. And when she met the Canadian team, saw the model they were using, which was back then the four digit code, um, she recommended they came back and trained Scottish clinicians. So Jen and I basically went away to this training in 2012, where we met alongside other um, speech and language colleagues and occupational therapists and some other clinical psychologists. And we took this learning back to Ayrshire. My role is as a lead for looked after and accommodated um, child health and a neurodevelopmental paediatrician, so FASD sits you know, right in between my, my areas of interest. And we knew we had children who needed this level of assessment, so we basically just kind of knitted together a bit of a, a virtual team and went on to diagnose 16 children. And then Jen and one of her colleagues audited how well we um, adhered to the Canadian model, which we'd been taught. Um, and we found that we had very good fidelity to the model, which was the gold standard um, at the time. Jen. Thank, oh. Thank you. Um, so we then 
put a bid together to the Scottish Government to see whether they would give some additional money just to free up some of our time so we could concentrate on developing a service um, and they gave us three years worth of funding I think it was going to be two years initially and the plan in that two years was to trial a pathway gain experience with FASD diagnosis and we had great support both from um, the Canadian team who trained us but also from Raja Mukherjee who ran uh, runs the, the the clinic in Surrey the the national FASD um, clinic in Surrey so as part of this, we developed um, awareness raising and training. And I think to date, along with colleagues, we have had awareness raising sessions for over 6,000 professionals um, in Scotland. And a lot of those will be in Ayrshire, but equally we have done roadshows to other health boards um, and helped supportive colleagues to, to raise awareness within their own patch. So this is just a very quick, this shows you what, what, what our team was made up of. Essentially it was uh, myself for a day a week. I think Jen started off as two days a week and then three days a week. At some points we've had her five days a week. And I think the demand um, to have, have people who are dedicated and, and able to support other colleagues in this was really, really important. We had some time from occupational therapists, some time from speech and language therapists, and we've had good support from public health. Initially, we were going to see 24 cases, um, so 24 cases per year. When we opened for referrals, we found we were full within four months, and I think that just shows the demand out there um, for, for families who are living with young people who have FESD, who may not be understood, um, and therefore it, uh, supports can't be tailored adequately for them. Um, so within four months, we basically filled our year one capacity and then we had to reduce our year two capacity because after the diagnosis, we found that we had to then provide intervention and support because there was no other agencies to, to um, provide this because people didn't understand um, how to support the affected children that we were diagnosing. Um, Jen and I are really rubbish at saying no to things and therefore when we knew that our pilot was full and we knew there was such a big demand for these assessments, we basically set about upskilling our colleagues within the CAM service in Ayrshire and also within the other paediatricians with whom I work and in your developmental centre. So actually you ended up getting the same assessment whether um, you, you saw us or, or went to CAMS or, or community paediatrics, which from a research point of view, we kind of did ourselves out of our comparison group, which um, was unfortunate, but it was definitely the best thing for the families that we're meeting. So our key objective following this pilot was to make sure that everything that we learnt, we could disseminate, all the mistakes we made, we could tell people what they were. And I think we're pretty open that we have made mistakes and we have changed the way we've done things. And, you know, we've certainly learned from, from the families that we've met along the way and other professionals we've learned, we've learned um, from along the way. But we have had probably input to over 200 assessments for children um, who, who may or may not have had an FESD diagnosis um, at the end of assessments but we have worked in partnerships with families we have developed resources in partnership with families and we work closely with our third sector which um, is the FESD hub which is supported by the Scottish Government and is a branch of Adoption UK Adoption UK Scotland and they are funded to support not only um, adoptive parents but also kinship and birth parents. So then we weren't quite finished so we felt that we wanted to explore what else we could do locally to improve intervention and support post-diagnosis. We also worked alongside um, colleagues on the Scottish Sign Guideline and um, that's available online. We've also set up as a, a team over the last, I think it must be almost two years now, to be a point of contact for other Scottish health boards. If there's professionals who wish um, some support, we'll discuss cases with them and um, give guidance. And we also were part of running joint training with the Canadian team who came back last year. And we managed to get 14 um, or more than 14 teams, but a team from all Scottish health boards, which is multidisciplinary, and we trained them in the method of the, the sign guideline, um, which we'd also helped develop. So we are building you know, a team here of people who should be becoming more confident in diagnosing FESD or assessing for FESD, but there's still you know, gonna be lots of training needs along the way. 
We had input into some of the prevention work, particularly um, locally in Ayrshire, and as I say, public health has probably led on the prevention work here. Um, but as a, a wider team, we've worked to develop a train the trainer programme to raise FESD awareness, and that was really to meet the demand for us attending training events. Um, we've done summary guides of FESD, we've got an alcohol pregnancy resource, and we've got a parent carer's guide and an educator's guide, both of which are um, available online. And as part of FESD Awareness Day today, we sent a pack to every CAMS uh, team in each health board in Scotland, which shows our resources, but also um, kind of it was things that OT recommended in terms of scaffolding learning and helping support young people, um, be it fidget toys, uh, daily planners, a video voice recorder for, for aiding kind of working memory. And again, an example of that pack can be seen online. I think Jen has probably been tweeting pictures of it um, so you can get a, a better look at it. Sign guideline is available online. Um, it's based on the Canadian guideline and that was published in 2016. So we basically, alongside Sign, made it more applicable for the Scottish context. There is um, lots of other associated resources. There's a parent and carer guide that goes along with that, which is very useful. And um, yeah, you'll find a link to that online. And I think at this point, Jen is going to take over and speak to you a bit about um, what the assessment looks like and how we've supported families over the course of the projects. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Um, thanks very much to HSE and to Mary and colleagues for inviting us along today and um, I'm just hoping to give a very quick overview. We've got limited time so it's very much a whistle stop tour and um, I've just noted down some of the queries from the, the chat as well about the diagnostic process and, and so I'll hopefully try and, and answer some of that as we go along. Um, as you could see, we're, we're quite a small team when we were doing our sort of specialist team approach, but essentially what we tried to do was to upskill um, a multidisciplinary team in each of our health board areas. So that would be including a clinical psychologist, occupational therapist, speech and language therapist, and a medical colleague, be it psychiatric, um, psychiatrist or paediatrician as well, so that they could um, undertake all those um, medical assessments and refer for genetics, MRI, um, where needed and also to do the facial feature assessment in the head circumference. So that's covering the brain structure bit that you see in the, the sort of top left. And essentially from um, the multidisciplinary team perspective, we were looking to get evidence of three or more of the areas that you see on the, the diagram there being affected to a significant uh, degree. And that's using standardized assessments um, where possible. So just to take you um, through the different assessments that we use, our occupational therapist would usually lead um, first in the assessment by looking at motor, fine motor, sensory issues, and um, looking at the, the profile of the child in respect to those. And quite a, a lot of the time we would see differences in um, sensory um, processing, and sometimes we would see differences in motor function, and sometimes these uh, difficulties hadn't been previously um, discovered. Um, in regards to communication, just very quickly again, this was led by our speech and language therapist, usually doing a standardised assessment like the KELF. And um, we found that a lot of the children, and we've got data that we're, we're publishing on this, um, had receptive, so comprehending what is being said um, was a difficulty sometimes also um, being able to express um, themselves. But it, it was interesting, a lot of these children really did look like they could chat the chat and had a lot of content in speech. But really, when you got a professional to scratch the surface of that, we were seeing there was a lot of masking, perhaps, of ability. And, and really, when you were sort of delving further, um, particularly the comprehension wasn't what you might expect from what was being presented. And these were some of the, the quotes that came from the parents and carers who fed into our service evaluation that you see online. Um, and you can read that. Um, about you know the, the difficulties day to day. The cognitive assessment was undertaken by myself or my clinical psychology colleagues, sometimes educational psychologists will have undertaken this. 
Um, and where possible, we would um, choose a, an assessment based on um, the children's uh, age and ability. And a lot of the children actually done not too badly on this, um, but not falling into that learning disability category. And clearly, if you were to stop at that, you would think, oh gosh, well, things are, are okay, it's a bit patchy, there's maybe some difficulties in working memory, but it is a screening assessment, so it's not definitive. And um, we do advocate for people to, again, delve further into the, the neuropsychology of the child. And I'll just take you through a few of the, the different other assessments that I would, I would undertake. One of them is attention. Um, we do screening assessments using questionnaire from parents and carers. But we did um, assess attention in a very boring uh, room with a very boring, quite lengthy assessment to see how the child would sit and attend in that um, quite contrived environment. And you could see that a lot of the kids, um, you know, had a strength in sustained attention. And that was despite many of them having been previously diagnosed with ADHD or um, not responding well to medication. Um, a lot of the children had ceased medication because it hadn't been working for them. And um, what we were finding is that when school environment was adapted for the child and it wasn't too overstimulating for them, that their, their attention was improving in that environment also. And when they were in an environment that the brain wasn't being overloaded, sustained attention could be seen. So it does make the, the teasing apart of ADHD and FASD all the more difficult, but interesting and, and worthy to do. Um, memory, again, was undertaken by myself or psychology colleagues. We did um, a standardised assessment where possible, not always was it possible. It was very linked to communication. We often had to have a, a multidisciplinary discussion about what was a lack of ability to understand versus um, not being able to remember. Because if you can't understand and chunk the information, then it's difficult to file in that filing cabinet. Um, this isn't to be confused with working memory, which is like if I gave you a telephone number and I just keep it in your mind, that sort of short-term um, active memory. Um, this is more sort of long-term visual and verbal memory. And for some children, it wasn't a difficulty, but for some, it really was and um, was evidenced, you know, to be even visual memory. And, and those are kids that were maybe asked to use visual means in school and it wasn't really working for them. Um, so, yeah, lots of times parents saying, you know, kids are just not remembering what I'm saying and from day to day not retaining the information and we were able to evidence that. And I should say on, on that, the back of that, normally my job was to evidence what parent and carers were saying because, you know, they were coming in, the experts on their child, and I was basically providing the evidence for, for what they, they were describing. Executive function is really important. It's the sort of frontal lobes of the brain, the chief executive, if you like, it takes about half an hour to, to assess. Um, there's a screening tool that parents and carers can also do. This is a bit of the brain that, that helps you sequence, organize, remember from the um, learn from mistakes, remember what happened yesterday and what you're doing next week. It's, it's the bit that, that really helps you with day-to-day -day function. And what we did find was that when we assessed for this, and this was a real area of difficulty, then the slide that you see here about adaptive and living skills was also a relative difficulty. They tended to correlate really strongly with each other, but not with cognition. And that's what's different from these kids to, to children with a learning disability. So the results of adaptive living skills is normally in the learning disability range. And again, as I repeat, not in, in keeping with their cognitive ability, but we suspect the executive functioning is what is, is impacting there. And so it's really important to get these measures of children. And also we ask teachers and, and class um, workers for reports about academic skills and, and take measures where possible as well as part of the, the assessment process. Very quickly to show the diagnostic algorithm that we use, um, if you have, for example, alcohol um, exposure confirmed and you have no sentinel facial features, which are measured by um, a pediatrician or psychiatrist, but you do have three or more areas where there's serious and um, significant uh, difficulties, then we would arrive at a diagnosis, FASD with sentinel facial features. We rule out the other explanatory reasons for a diagnosis, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We do co-assess um, for ADHD and autism alongside because there are so many overlaps, but I do believe that you can differentiate as well, particularly if you have a good MDT way of working. And we also take into consideration other um, substance use, um, but to be honest, looking at the evidence of heroin and cocaine use and whatnot, 
it's actually the alcohol that is the most significant teratogen of them all. And that's why, um, but we do take a, a full history of, of developmental um, exposures. The key learning about prevention we've already covered, and I'm sure I don't need to say again about the no alcohol, no risk, and, and the, re the reasons why we need to have supportive conversations with people about prevention. Um, but identification, we, we do know that, you know, neurodevelopmental issues and mental health issues, the overlap is the norm, and we need these children to be assessed within services that can recognise that. We need comprehensive risk histories, and what would help are better recording systems particularly for care experienced children who have had prenatal exposures and Sarah is doing some research and work on that. Um, in Scotland we recommended that services should be accepting of referrals with FASDs queried that they should be assessed for under a neurodevelopmental pathway not just specifically an FASD assessment and treatment centre that wasn't going to work for us in Scotland because of the prevalence and the need and assessment is complex but you can do it um, and the diagnosis can be co-created, the language around it can be um, considered um, holistically with the family, but the most important bit is that profile of strengths and difficulties and what that means for the child and the family. And the intervention coming from that is driven by a good understanding of that brain profile to provide the right support and the right training to the professionals and team around the child. We need to learn more about the impact of FASD in, in the context of Scotland and just to show you evaluate to our, our team um, kind of launching into being a national resource we also have um, my slides are just struggling to keep up with my need to go really fast because <laughs> I know I'm running out of time the next slides I'm just struggling to move it on um, there we are the next uh, plan is to continue the um, commitments from the Scottish Government in our work thinking about raising awareness. We're still developing in Scotland, it's not all sorted. We need to still improve early identification, assessment diagnosis. We've now got our third sector hub that probably needs to expand as time goes on. And um, the government have also committed to, you know, more education and training provision and thinking about the recording. And part of the government's um, work has been to link with us and other experts in FASD around the creation of e-learning modules. We do face-to-face -face training, and we're also working on doing diagnostic training for, um, for people in the future. And uh, we also run, uh, or we're looking to work with partners to run an FASD uh, forum where we can bring people together to continue the professional development. But the big question is how are we going to implement this in Scotland? Well, we found out that there was a simultaneous piece of work regarding the uh, mental health service provision for children. And um, Dame Denise Coya um, chaired that group and um, did um, an amazing piece of work. Um, the late Dame Denise um, was a marvellous lady who achieved so much and put together this framework of recommendations for the task force one of which was recognising the extent of neurodevelopmental difficulties in CAMS and in community paediatrics and the need for better ways of working for those children and families. We've linked with them and so far we have a project initiation document and the, the task force is committed to the design of a neurodevelopmental service. Um, and these are services to be in every health board rolling out across Scotland which will, as you see in the second point there, include the needs and assessments required by children affected by prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, there will be no wrong door approach. Um, this is all very aspirational. This is all in a project document saying this is what we hope to do. This isn't what we've done already and we are working hard. But there is a, a particular note in the, the, the PED saying that there will be um, particular attention paid to children, young people in care and at risk of going into care and to those who've been exposed to drugs and alcohol in utero. This would be, this schematic was um, done by a colleague in Greater Glasgow and Clyde and I think captures our hopes for these children and you see FASD there under that umbrella, but thinking about all the other things, all the other explanations and contributing factors. This is just a slide with our support and resources and um, you can see how people can contact us. And we are really working hard now over the next six months. And um, we've got funding to bridge with a university, um, Edinburgh University, and we will continue being members of these um, research groups. 
and to think about all the data that we've collected so far about professionals' knowledge, the health economics, parent and carer views as a current research study that we are committed to doing first, and then looking at neuropsychological profiles. And that's the end of the presentation. I hope I haven't went over time. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, uh, hi, Jen and Sarah. Thank you both very much. Um, I have a fair number of questions uh, that have come through and I, I'm not sure if uh, I'll just move on with them. I think uh, what we have agreed is that Jennifer and Sarah will answer, would go into a little bit more detail on some of the, the questions that have been answered about, or been asked about their you know, quite practically based um, and detailed presentations. Um, and for about 10 minutes, so we'll have questions in relation to the Scottish experience. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your last slide about your uh, keen to collaborate because a lot of the questions and comments we're getting uh, from the uh, participants are very praiseworthy and laudatory about your efforts. And we will, in Ireland, uh, we would look forward to, to linking with you, I think. Um, one of the questions that, that is coming up quite a bit is the, the whole relationship between uh, intellectual uh, development, neurodevelopmental issues and FASD and in terms of specifically the interventions that are more helpful um, I suppose more of the questions are about the treatment, but there are some about diagnosis, but maybe just in terms of the general interventions um, where you might often have a, maybe not a rock solid diagnosis because they can be hard to get. So Sarah and Jennifer, I leave you uh, interact on that. Um, yeah, that's fine. I'm happy to, to comment on that, Joe. It's a really good question. Um, so a lot of the time, the, 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 the profile of the individual child was different. And, and what was interesting is a lot of the time, uh, a major part of the intervention process was allowing people around the child to understand that profile in more, in more detail. So in schools, really understanding at what level can a child understand? How many things can they keep in their head at the one time? What environmental differences do we need to put in place in the school and at home? What um, memory aids do we need to put in place? Thinking about it, I suppose, along the lines of a, of a brain injury and needing to either, well, you, it's difficult to, to rehabilitate brain injury, but in children, there's lots of growth and plasticity to come. How can we really harness the strengths and what can we do to um, help foster growth and development in the areas that are tricky? So asking our OTs about how we can help with fine motor development, gross motor development, some of these areas people didn't even know needed extra focus and we, we kind of call it like shining a light onto the, the areas but also to help them to to grow and develop and for the things that are struggling to grow and develop we've got aids and memory aids and, and visual planners that help children and um, compensate for for the things that they, they find difficult but the, the key is understanding and that's why we designed our booklets and pamphlets which are available to everybody that you can go onto our website and just take them um, and download them it's, it's the understanding and the relief at being understood that was probably the most therapeutic bit for me. And I don't know, Sarah, I'll add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, so I, I often meet the families right at the beginning and I take a, a history and, you know, we refer on to other, other colleagues. And m my role's often the, the least time consuming. Um, I come back in towards the end to think about the formulation um, and, and add in the medical components. By and large, we're never telling families things they don't already know about their children. But what we do is put it in language that other agencies will recognise and understand. I also think one of the biggest therapeutic differences is often when people understand what level a child's functioning at, the expectations change and that leads to the child being able to achieve more in people's eyes because the expectation might not be what you're asking for their age but what you're asking for is for their stage and if they can manage that then that gives them that, that chance to improve their self-esteem it can kind of de um diffuse sometimes some of the tensions in the house if you think you've got a 12 year old who should be doing things like other 12 year olds but if actually if you think about them like an eight year old and need to support them in how to plan for their school day etc that can really really help and 
that doesn't require a diagnosis. It just, I suppose, if general uses the word lens. It just, it just requires people to see children in a slightly different way under a slightly different lens. The one thing I think we're always surprised at, and usually we can predict, or families tell us what their children really struggle with. One thing that I think has been really key and that Jen and I have learned over the years is um, the impact that having a really good quality speech and language therapy assessment can make. Because often children and young people appear that they're age appropriate with their their language, um, you know, but, but actually when you really drill down, you can find that they're really quite lost when you're using complex language. I think children who are feeling lost or who are struggling to achieve what other people expect of them can often act out in, in different ways and um, demonstrate their, you know, frustration. And that can be quite misinterpreted both by families and, and supporting agencies. Um. Can I just ask another uh, another question? Uh, people are just looking for practical advice about breastfeeding. There has been a few questions about that. So I, I can answer that one. I think you know the advice regarding breastfeeding is that you should be avoiding alcohol when you're breastfeeding. Um, the, the the science behind that is one thing. I think the other thing though is if you're drinking alcohol and feeding, where is the I suppose there's a risk about how competent you are to care for an infant, are you going to be sleeping more deeply if the infant falls asleep next to you whilst you're feeding. So there's other risks associated with without um, even you know, simply just thinking about the, the alcohol that would be in the breast milk and being passed to the child. So I think it's kind of a wider, a wider question. And uh, are your, your service in Ayrshire and Ireland, is that a sort of leading across Scotland? Are you sort of... Um, training the rest of the country as well i was trying to figure that out and because yeah. access to access to good and that is quite and then we'll move we can open it up then after after this question maybe to the the, the sixth panel uh, we could be some other questions that are linked just the structure yeah. of how we, and i know you're obviously getting money in different sources so so i'll, I'll let jen answer this one as long as she doesn't promise to come and train everybody in Europe whilst we're still there. <laughs> yeah, so there, there is, as I said, there's a long way to go, but the, the hope is that our team can help to scaffold and support others to be more confident in FESD. And it's almost like a cascade model of knowledge and then confidence. What we've learned is that you can't just supply people with a guideline, like, you know, the site guideline and say, can you do this? People need to have experiential training and we've now partnered with the Canadian colleagues to learn how to do that and we've, we've co-run sessions with them and so we're hoping to do sort of um, diagnostic training but to be honest we're needing to um, bridge with the university and build an infrastructure to allow us to think about how we would go about doing that and get a training strategy so all of that um, has been managed by the Scottish government so far and I think about 400 clinicians have been trained through the Scottish Government arranging diagnosis and training for clinicians from across the country um, and we are just maybe hoping to build on that in time but it's a huge job and it'll take time and we are still you know in the early stages of growth there. Okay I think what what we will do now is we will invite um, Mary and Geraldine and Caroline and um, And Noel to join us as well. So we'll open up. We have about a half. We have a half an hour left. Um, and um, what I want to do uh, firstly um, is ask Caroline to say a little bit. That Caroline works with Tusla, uh, which is our our child and family service. Or does uh, uh, quite a lot of talk about. Um, the, the integration between ch children's services and children in care. Um, any impressions, I suppose, uh, because it's, this is holistic care, so as we're trying to achieve in Ireland. So I don't know, Caroline, if you have any anything you'd like to sort of contribute just at this stage. Yes, yeah. I mean, TUSLA, as you know, has early intervention, prevention, family support, but also we have such a big range of children in care. We've over 6,000 children in care, most of them are fostered, and there is and has been for years now 
I suppose, a frustration in trying to assist these children um, through accessing CAM services, through HSE services, through actually trying try to privately fund therapeutic services. So this model that you are, are, I suppose, promoting and have talked to us is such a promise, I suppose, of hope for the future, okay? And we're very much, I suppose, on track in terms of working with the HSE around hidden harm, in particular, the adult addiction services and the community and, and voluntary sector and our TUSA services have access to joint e-learning on hidden harm and fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are part of that understanding the perinatal antenatal uh, part of it. One of our questions, I suppose, is really how can we incorporate, I suppose, a wider range of practitioners, including our CAMs, in having a community around practice on this because there's very much an interconnection and we don't have that easy at the moment, really. It took a number of years to get the hidden harm e-learning up and running for HSA and TUSLA. So it'd be really important, I suppose, to, to highlight, and we'd like to understand maybe how we can get that integrated mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. uh, planning at this stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll come back to practice again. In, in, thank you, Caroline. And just, Noel, in relation to, from your perspective, are there any comments you, you'd like to make, I suppose, on the Scottish experience, but equally the other presentations, and then we'll, we'll move on to... to uh, Questions that will be answered by several panel members, I would imagine. So, Noel, if you're there. Sorry, <laughs> difficulty with the mute button. Um, I guess we're excited by all the Scottish team have uh, achieved, and we look forward to um, further development in Ireland because it's been very difficult um, not having. Uh, access to services or access to diagnosis um, for a lot of families. Um, just to mention, I'm uh, representing the group NPA at the moment. Uh, we are an all yeah, Ireland, all it, Ireland it, support group. Do you want to just say and, a little bit about it? Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so we have okay. experience from families that are made up of biological, adoptive, foster families all variations and um, caring for people with FASD. Um, so we're seeing the front line or the, we're on the ground with people who are actually living it. Um, and we would like to okay. see progress in that area too. Okay, thank you. Um, now I have a few other questions and many of them are linked. So I'll, uh, um, one is to do with the practice in maternity hospitals. There, there's been a few questions about this. Why isn't this issue addressed in more detail? Um, now, I know, Geraldine, maybe you can, you can talk about the challenges because we, we were trying to get it to get not quite screening, but get even questions asked about alcohol in pregnancy uh, higher on the agenda. And maybe, Mary, from your role and the expert advisory group, you might say what the aspirations are there. Because, and there are other questions about the expert advisory group that you might like to answer in terms of the guy, you know, what the aim is, what the time scale. And for Geraldine then, what were the real challenges uh, with your peers in trying to get this issue higher up the agenda in Letterkenny? And um, there have also been questions about where where people can get access to your evaluation report. So maybe we start with Mary and Geraldine on the, on the issue of the antenatal care and how that can be better delivered with a, a FASD in mind. Thank you, Joe. Well, as you say, we've been trying to get more information on alcohol and pregnancy collected during pregnancy. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Siobhan Jennings, who's now retired, but she drew up a minimum data set for the whole Healthy Ireland for our key priority areas. And that has been included in the electronic maternity record. So at least now on the electronic maternity record, we have it primed to prompt people to ask the questions about alcohol and, you know, and to prompt what action should happen depending on the answers that they get. Um, as you know, the electronic record, I suppose, to date, it is only rolled out in four hospitals in the country, and we have 19 maternity hospitals. So that's kind of a, a slow burn and, and a slow process. 
we are still at a situation trying to get general acceptance of the message, you know, with all our nursing and medical colleagues that no amount of alcohol at any stage of pregnancy is safe for your baby. And that's, I suppose, one of the first things that we'd be hoping the FASD expert advisory group would do is that, that we would develop a statement for the HSE on pregnancy and alcohol, and then that we would take that forward and hope to get joint positions with the constituent colleges like the Institute of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, Faculty of Public Health, you know, and through the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. Okay, and there was a few questions, Mary, just about is, is the membership and the aims of the in terms of reference of the expert advisory group, is that public? Is that accessible, like? Uh, Joe, Mary's just gone for a moment, if you want to go to Geraldine. Okay. Geraldine, hi. Uh, just uh, um, in relation to your, your presentation and, you know, the um, getting the buy-in and all that, could you, yeah. could you give us an idea of what were the, uh, mainly just, I suppose, because the idea would be to try and replicate, I presume, what you're doing in other parts of the country, and what would you see will be the challenges and how might they be, you know, overcome? Um, for us, I suppose time was a challenge, you know, d during the process, but we overcame that. Um, as for the follow on process, I suppose there was a mix of work schedules in the different agencies and lack of resources. But I would have to say that we, we have continued with a very comprehensive alcohol assessment for every pregnant woman coming to book at the antenatal clinic. Uh, whilst we don't have the national electronic system, we have a different electronic system, which incorporates a very comprehensive um, assessment for alcohol. Um, this will be accentuated now with the use, with the rollout of MEC, which is going to put more emphasis on, on that as well. So we are still actively um, assessing ladies and um, acting on the, the results that we find. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Caroline, there was just two questions. One about whether a legal guardian can get a social worker and the other is whether um, training uh, will be provided for questions um, you know whether, whether training is being provided you know within within Tusla for for relevant staff about FASD specifically um, what I would say is that currently we don't have specific training on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders it's the hidden harm e-learning that we have, which is accessible um, for all staff and there will be classroom training. I do know that a lot of uh, our teams, our social work teams and our foster parents, but we do not have a bespoke training available. Right. Okay, um, there's another question about other psychoactive substances, whether they can impact on the development of the fetus's brain, and, and that's um, benzodiazepines and methadone and things like that, because obviously some people take alcohol only, some people take alcohol with other stuff. So for um, anybody want to, any, uh, Jennifer or Sarah or, or Mary? What the question is about is uh, people who are, say, using, using other substances apart from alcohol. Yeah. The, the most recent um, evidence we've been presented, and um, I suppose this goes along with what, what else is in the literature, is that you know, alcohol, because of the, the ethanol molecule, is, and it freely passes across cells and the, and the, the placenta, it, it has probably more teratogenic and it well it does it has more teratogenic effects than heroin cocaine other sort of drugs that you might um, hear about the the evidence that we heard in in vancouver canada that there was a conference and um, the the synergistic effect between um, synthetic cannabis and alcohol their thinking can be worse than alcohol alone um, but certainly that's why we we usually 
are quite confident about our differentials when we've got a strong alcohol history and that is something we do look for in all of our assessments. Um, and we do look in terms of the number of um, binges, if you like, during pregnancy to be, um, you know, it depends on how, how, it, how much is ingested within a binge, but three or more would be something that we would be thinking about. And I think your confidence level of attributing um, your FESD goes up with the more binges and it tends to be our alcohol histories are quite strong. Um, and very rarely there, there may be one or two or three, um, but you, you just never know because of the genetic makeup of the mum, the placenta, the, the fetus, the nutritional uh, elements. There's, there's lots of complicating factors, but that's what we would say um, about the, the drugs because people do sometimes think heroin is worse and it, and it isn't. Thank you. I don't know if anyone would want to add to that. I, I suppose I would just add that I think we're seeing a shift in recording, certainly with an Ayrshire and out with, with greater awareness about the importance of recording alcohol histories and our local training, we often get it included now in referral letters. So what I would like is for every child who gets referred into a child development centre um, to have, as medics and, and people who refer in, we're very used to saying, you know, such and such was born at 37 weeks gestation, weighing four kilos. And, and it's part of the narrative that we say they were born by cesection or, um, you know, normal delivery. And actually that matters far less than whether the pregnancy was recognised at four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, whether it was a concealed pregnancy, whether lifestyle changed, you know, that, that's the kind of information that we need to get people to be thinking about and getting people to capture. Because if we're not changing that out there in our um, support services, be it health, you know, for, for people who are more vulnerable, if they're involved with um, other support services, it's capturing that information and making sure that it's well documented and well recorded because with the best and there is no substantial substantial alcohol history that, that I can locate. Even if I think that, that it was very likely to be FESD, you can't make that diagnosis. You need to have either the facial features or a solid alcohol history. Um, equally, the diagnosis in itself is not the be all and end all. It's actually the understanding that goes with a good neurodevelopmental profile. So if you're struggling to get an alcohol history and you're struggling to get um, and if you don't facial features, it's about having that really good, well-rounded understanding about a child's profile and that should still be able to help you understand that child and help them access the supports they need. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a range of questions and comments that are essentially asking, can we be a bit more like in how we resource and deal with this issue? Because we do get a lot of support from Scotland on alcohol issues generally, uh, uh, in, in public health in Ireland and also we have a very similar um, demographic and behavioural cultural links um, and the question is whether uh, how, how can, and this is, I suppose is a question for I mean Mary is involved with the EAG uh, how, how can we make uh, assessment uh, more robust uh, how can we make, um, you know, have multidisciplinary teams, have hubs, you know, where people are dedicated, where, they, where their role is to, uh, is to try and help children and their families uh, to deal with what something is not that easy to diagnose, as Eric says, but that's not the issue. I mean, they, to, to, make, to make child services um, better in the, in the context of uh, FASD, uh, what sort of structures, um, uh, I don't know whether there's any, any, anybody has any uh, information about a grant plan. I know that the, the HSE would like to have and is hoping to have better, you know, better assessment systems and that, uh, but how can that, uh, how can, um, and you know, better diagnostic clinics and stuff like that, how can we make that more likely to happen and what's the practical way we can get support from our colleagues in Scotland. So that's a question for everybody. Anybody wants to, to step in with that, but that's coming up quite a lot. 
I suppose it's well recognised that we are lacking supports for, you know, services for diagnosis and for intervention with FASD in Ireland. And I suppose I'm not clear, Joe, as to how we can go about building it really, you know, in that it will require leadership really from child and adolescent mental health and from paediatrics. But we, you know, we do have those represented on the expert advisory group. And I think this, even this survey that we are planning, you know, will hopefully identify how maybe we can try to go forward or what the extent of the need is so that we can put the business plan together as well for the HSE. Okay. Um, can I ask Sarah and Jennifer, you mentioned at the end, I think it was yourself, Jennifer, at the end of the, your presentation that you would like to collaborate. Would you want, to, would you like to give something what, how how could you see that happening? Because I think it would be uh, very uh, helpful to us to you know to to be able to maintain some relationship with what yeah, you're think, doing. I'm just watching Sarah anxiously, looking at what I'm about to say. I just think that it's really um, hard when we're not in the same room. You see. I think in the world of FASD, I mean, we, we, we are really aware of standing on the shoulders of giants. People have done so much work for decades to get mm -hmm. us to where we are just now. And people like Raja Mukherjee in the UK, Sandra Butcher, Nofas, um, many others that know who they are. We are indebted to them and we've gotten so much help. And I think that's why our website is open to people uh, to use our resources. And we are making a sort of UK network of people interested in FASD and research. There might be scope to think about international connections, thinking about connections between countries, how we share learning in a sort of efficient way that, you know, might not entail us going away for too long, Sarah. But, uh, you know, with our government's permission, I think we are, we are keen to share our learning and not like, not have everybody reinventing the wheel is essentially the nub of it. And um, that's as well why we want to get our research and evidence base out there because our countries are very similar. And I think we're very open to wanting to connect with other clinicians and help other people move services forward. I suppose I'm always bad cop to Jen's, you know, enthusiastic kind of personality, simply because we are both part time at this. We could do this day in, day out, you know, 52 weeks of the year. And the reality is that we need to link with like minded people who need support, but are able to drive things on in their own kind of patch. Even within Scotland, we don't see children from out with, with Ayrshire. We're not a national service. We were a service that was started up within a health board to gain a bit of expertise. And then we can cons consult and support other um, clinicians and professionals. We have had a bit of an extension in our funding, which is good. And I would hope that we will build on that you know, year on year. I think there is a huge need for good quality, recurring diagnostic training and ongoing support and that's not just within Scotland you know there should be it should be able to be available to it's not really about the clinicians it's about the families that need to be able to access people who are able to help them move forward with their their family life um, and make sure they have happy happy young people and, and successful adults and I suppose part of what drives us is wanting that for as many people as we can but there's got to be a little bit of realism that we are, we do struggle to, to, to meet the demand for, for training. I, I am not as probably good at Jen on terms of kind of webinars and social media and all the rest of it. And there's huge limitations from kind of just those softer skills and doing things on web-based platforms. But what it does mean is we can do training that's, you know, an hour and a half long without having to get on a plane and fly to a different country and stay in a hotel, you know, and do it. So, so, so in some ways our time has, we, we can be a wee bit more generous with, with some of our time. And I think that that's probably one of the benefits of COVID is that we're able to connect in a way in a platform that we never would have, nobody would have envisaged this being possible probably a year ago. Um, so I think that there are new ways of working and collaborating um, and we'd certainly be open to that. I think we probably need to get ourselves into a, a, a place where we've got a dedicated training resource that we can, you know, use and, and try and use that as a as a support for other other interested professionals. Okay, I've I've about 
the questions are still coming in. Uh, we're still almost 400 pounds. So there's a few quick ones that are fair, there. And I'd start, one is for TUSLA as to whether there is any uh, thought being given to having some type of a screening or assessment tool uh, to make some adjudication uh, when a child comes into care, because that's come up. Um, that is one. A second one is advice uh, about talking to parents about the implications. I mean, that's fairly general, but it's, it's sort of fairly practical. Um, and is there any link with the school system in terms of, because the schools uh, are, are areas where, where, where issues can come to light for the first time ever, whether there's any, and I know some of these questions can't be answered, but uh, we can maybe follow up on the seminar, whether there's any link with the schools in terms of um, being a support uh, uh, when, when this is becoming an issue. So it's just that, first of all about children coming into care, because it's, mm -hmm. I suppose it, it does, uh, leaving the resource issues aside for the moment, but the, there are lots of gaps in the health end of child services, for sure. And there's disputes between who's responsible for mental health services. And these are as old as, as I've been in the health service. But if we really want to try and support children, um, I think this issue needs to be taken more seriously by all of us. Absolutely. No, I would agree. And I suppose... Yes, but one of the biggest things for us is when we do make care plans for children, we need the expertise of help. We need yeah. the expertise. We do know that children are coming with adversities, OC and partnership, and resources to be prioritised for this very high need group. So I would say yes, and I would say yes to having really good training for our foster carers, for our social workers, but it has to be expert-led and evidence-informed, and it has to have proper care pathways, proper assessments and interventions, really. The diagnosis piece, I think, has been eye-opening in terms of you have to have that multidisciplinary team, and it has to be resourced to work together, and it has to have that specialist function in order to prioritise those children. So all of the things that have been raised by the, the panel and by the questions that have been raised, I would say, are highlighting the gaps that have been there I think what we have positively working for us at the moment is that we have expertise to draw on, but we have good working relationships that we need to actually come together much more, I suppose, focused in terms of this work um, and to drive it onwards. And TUSA will be very much behind that because we have to advocate and we are promoting children's well-being and their life, their futures. The futures of these children is so important that we get it right as early as possible. In terms of parents um, who may be um, referred into TUSA, just to say under our Children First guidance, there is a lot of support, I suppose, for, for referrers in terms of if they have reasonable concerns or grounds for concern, they should approach our social services and have the conversation about how mm -hmm. supports might be needed or if there needs to be a social work assessment in terms of child protection and welfare. Okay. Okay. Thanks, I Caroline. Just say, I'm not sure um, if this fits in here, but I just thought I should say that the, the best learning that I have done is has been from the parents and carers using the service that we piloted. And I think it's so crucial that we really, especially when we think about all the type of families that will be involved in these services, that we are led by them and the development of training and, and services. And you know, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that, but I just wanted to make that really clear that from Scotland's learning, that's been our key message. Absolutely. Okay. There are there are a few questions from people who are looking for immediate help, and I don't know how we. I don't think we can uh, signposting people to services. So, um, uh, could somebody? Uh, is there a directory of in services within the HSE as to where people might go? Um, who have difficulties with their children and are not quite sure what's, what's happening. Is it FASD? Well, a few questions have come up in that, in that, in that um, area. Uh, so maybe I know that the, this, um, 
webinar has been recorded and I think the plan is to put it, it, the contents up on the YouTube channel of Health and Wellbeing. Um, but obviously, seminars with 500 people will, you know, will, will bring up lots of issues that, that need to be addressed after the webinar where possible. So um, we just need to think of that within the HSE as to how we can um, <clears throat> signpost people um, as to where might they may get some help. Can I briefly address that, Joe? Pardon? Can I sure, take yeah. a shot at that sure. for a minute? Thanks. Yeah. Um, our website is available. We have a Facebook group, which is becoming more active. We're not that long in, in uh, operation. Um, just a couple of years at this point, but we also have very active online and in person support groups about every month. Um, we also can respond to Facebook messaging and private messages, phone calls. We will meet up for a couple with someone if they need a chat, if we're in a local area, we're spread out throughout the country. Um, we're trying to currently set up local hubs as well as the national um, meetings that we do have frequently. We were mm -hmm. using Zoom for the last couple of years before it became so popular. <laughs> um, and we have practical resources and downloadable stuff on our website, which can just give parents and carers somewhere to start, um, actions they can take today um, that will help in managing their, their child usually, but also any other affected person with FASD. And um, we can give some guidance on um, professionals to approach um, particular assessments to request when you are offered some services or assessments. And um, it's, it's more helpful. And we also help them work with schools because a lot of the issues arise in school and cause a lot of difficulty there. Okay, Noel, that's very helpful. Um, we will work out the logistics, but I mean, the, the, there is going to be, as I said, the, the, the proceedings will go up and there, are, there have already been some websites and presentations so under information I think it would be useful because there's been um, there's been a lot of questions um, all different types of questions we tried to just cover some of them and um, as many as we could because there was a lot of overlap. Joe just to say that we have a full report of the questions that were unanswered so we right. can endeavour to answer them post-webinar and get them out to the attendees. That's terrific, uh, Leo, yeah. Um, might so might I just launch a poll before you wrap up, Joe? Might I sure. just launch yeah. our final poll there? Uh, there's been a lot of information there, so we just want to gauge the audience, please. So did you learn something new about FASD through your participation in this webinar? So if you could vote there, folks, before Joe wraps up for today. Thank you very much. That's great, Joe. If you want to wrap up, I'll share the results oh. there. Okay. Oh, I mean, at the wrap up is really uh, thank yous, I think, and just where are we going now? So, first thing, thank you. I'd like to thank. Um, Leo Colgan uh, and Shane Hartigan from IMS. Uh, they have steered us through, uh, us that have been involved in putting this together, uh, have, have steered us through uh, very well over the last few days to get, to get things as good as we could do. Uh, and I hope the experience was fairly good for people. Um, so thank you to, to Leo and Shane, firstly. Uh, and then to the organizing group. I really had nothing to do with it. I was asked to chair it. Um, and specifically the, the presenters, um, Mary O'Mahony, uh, Geraldine uh, Hanley, uh, Jennifer Shields and, and Sarah Brown from Scotland and Noel Yudkin and Caroline um, from, from, from Tusla. Thank you all very much for your presentations and your inputs and thank you all participants. There's 313 of you left, uh, but there was up to 500 at one stage. Um, so as I said, the proceedings have been recorded and we will, there will be some follow-up for sure um, you will answer specific questions uh, because basically you, you, we all have us have to, to demonstrate an unmet need uh, before things really move along in this country. So this, this has been quite an important event 
in the in the story of FASD uh, within Ireland to, to try and and get something moving and um, really you know provide a proper service for people who require it. Um, and uh, Caroline Jordan from from Tusla as well. So thank you all. Um, and uh, I don't think there's anything else left to be said. Um, I'd, I'll just initially as well, who weren't on, on screen today, Fergal Fox and, and Marion Rackard, who did quite a bit of work behind the scenes to make this event happen. Uh, these things don't happen by chance and they've been in preparation for months. And again, this was a special thank you to our two Scottish colleagues. I, I always find working with Scottish people is, uh, is really terrific and a great experience. And it's the same today. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thanks, Sarah and Jennifer. Thanks, Noah and Sharon. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Thanks, very much. We're all leaving.